Hey students, it's time to study for our second exam. So to let you know, the second exam, it'll be 50 multiple choice questions, pretty straightforward. You have the entire 80 minutes of class to take the exam, though don't be surprised, some people will take the entire 80 minutes, some people will be done in 30 minutes. So don't worry if you see people leaving and you're not even halfway done, or if you're going all the way, it's okay, okay? So don't worry. So we're gonna go over the exam from the back of the book. First question on this one is, what refers to the process of buying and selling goods or services to be used in the production of other goods and services for consumption by the buying organization and are resale by wholesalers and retailers? <sighs> this is why I no longer have you memorize definitions. That is the definition of D, business to business marketing. Because remember, business to business, that's when Apple sells its phones to Walmart and then Walmart sells it to you. Apple's not selling directly to you, it's selling it to Walmart first. So that's B2B kind of things. Or when Bob's Farms sell their tomatoes to Subway, that's B2B because then they use the tomatoes in their sandwiches to sell to you, okay? But when it's just between the businesses, it's business to business marketing, D. Number two, which type of marketing sees suppliers located near their customers? That is also B, business to business marketing, okay? Because in, B, in B2B, you have to be where your customers are because there's so many fewer customers. It's kind of like a long distance relationship. It's kind of hard to keep up that strong relationship when you're so far away from each other. That's why you saw in the auto industry, a lot of the, men, like the car industry was based in Detroit, so all the suppliers got based in Michigan as well. So you had that, because they knew that, hey, if we want to keep Ford happy, we need to be there in case they want to come see us or we need to go do something. And if you're across the country, it's a little more difficult. Same thing with relationships, okay? So two is B. Three, Tiffany loves her deep dish anchovy and garlic pizza. Tiffany also likes to be alone. Uh, she orders it every time from Papa John's Pizza without even thinking about their other alternatives. This is an example of what kind of buying situation. So let's think about it. She's ordering without thinking. She's not asking anybody about it. She's like, this is what I get. Boom. No problem. That is a definition of a straight rebuy. B. Those are the rebuys where there is no thinking. This is, you know, I don't have to ask my boss to reorder toilet paper because it's kind of already okayed. So we're not thinking about it. We have a preferred supplier. We just order from them okay without thought all right now if there's more thinking involved that's something else but this one no thought automatically doing it straight rebuy okay now number four in a request for proposal a firm will describe how they want their potential suppliers to communicate their proposals sometimes the answer is in the question to the firm this will allow for the firm to better compare different proposals from various firms this description would fit into which part of the request for proposal that is c requirements for proposal presentation because when you are getting all these rfps coming in it's sometimes hard to compare things so you want to make sure you're comparing oranges to oranges not oranges to apples because things get really confusing so you want to lay out this is what we want to know this is how we want to put together you know do you want to in powerpoint presented in 20 minutes focusing on the key you know f factors here you, you lay out all that out okay because it makes it a lot easier to compare so four is c Number five, Benedict is an analyst who notices, that's the key word, notices that his computer system is no longer adequate to do his job. He tells his superiors and coworkers that a change in computer systems needs to happen. In this sense, uh, that should be Benedict, is what part of the buying center? That would be B, initiator, because he's the one that initiates the noticing the issue that we need to make some changes. Now, some people would say, well, he's also a user. Yes, he would also be a user, but that is not one of the options, okay? So remember, in the exam, if you think there could be another answer that's there and it's not, it's because I didn't want to make it confusing. There's another answer. So that's why here, number five would be B, initiator, okay? Number six, from where can companies determine the needs and or wants of their customers? Well, you can get it from your suppliers because your suppliers might say, hey, um, I'm supplying these other people and they're looking for stuff so you can learn from them. Your salespeople, yeah, I mean, your salespeople talk to your customers and the customers say, hey, I need this, I need that. Like, they're going to learn from them. And your competitors, you can learn from them. I mean, think about all the value meals we've that have popped up over the years that people learned from the first companies, the competitors, what works on the value meal? What works on the dollar menu? That's why when you go around, you notice every dollar menu, you know, in the U.S. seems to have a cheeseburger, a hamburger, some kind of chicken burger, right? And then some small number of nuggets and then like a fry option. No matter where it is, that's always there because the competitors help to learn that, hey, this could actually work. Okay, so six is D, all of the above. Lucky number seven. 
Which part of a request for proposal is most important when dealing with subcontractors? C, scope of work, because they don't have a scope of work, they're not gonna get done what you need them to get done. Next up, number eight. What is the correct order of the B2B buying process? Now, for all these correct order things, I tend not to ask those questions as much anymore, so don't be freaking out if you don't have the exact order down all the time. I try to stay away from those just to give you the heads up. But in this exam, I have like three of these, so be ready. Uh, eight, what is the correct order for the B2B buying process? That is A, okay? Need recognition, it's that initiator. Somebody has to notice there's an issue out there. Second part, product specification. That's where you lay out exactly what you need for this help to happen, right? What it needs to do. Then you have the RFP process, that request for proposal process. You put out and say, hey, we need help. Can one of you suppliers help us out? And then proposal analysis and supplier selection. So then you get the proposals in, you analyze, you say, hey, I wanna work with you. And then you have the order specification where you actually lay out exactly what it is you want, like the finalized kind of thing. And then at the end, you have vendor performance assessment using metrics, because you wanna know is, if I use these people, was it good? Should I use them again? That's one of the biggest things. When you're looking at B2B, because there's so much turnover in business or people get promoted, you wanna make sure you're keeping kind of a record who is a good supplier to work with, because if you don't know, you might make the same mistakes that the person that used that's a different supplier 10 years ago did, and like, oh, those are really bad suppliers. They didn't do their job. Oh, I didn't know. We didn't keep records of it. So that's why it's really important to have that vendor analysis, okay? So eight is A. Number nine, which of the following global entry strategies poses the least risk for a firm abroad? That would be exporting A, because literally if you're gonna export, the worst thing that's gonna happen is it's gonna do sink in the ocean and you lose that, okay? So it's the le usually the least amount of risk because the least amount of financial risk, okay? So nine is A. B, what are the steps in the market segmentation process? Again, one of these step things. It's B, start with strategy or objective. So why am I going to be dividing up the market. What's the point of that, right? Then we have segmentation methods. So what segmentation method we're we gonna use? Is it gonna be geographic segmentation, demographic segmentation, psychographic segmentation, benefit segmentation? We have to figure out which one we're gonna use. Then once we divide it up, we have to evaluate segment attractiveness. Which is the more attractive segment to go for? Who are we gonna go for first, second, and third? Because you can't go for everybody at the same time. So you wanna figure out who's the more sexy of the segments to go for and so you're going to target those to sell to um, next select that target market right after we've evaluated them and then identify and develop positioning strategies so to fit into that market to fit there what do we need to do that's why it's important if we want to target people that want to buy you know they go for the economic side of things so hey if we're gonna have a store how do we make our our store look like that. That's why when you walk into a Sam's Club, you know, or you walk into a Walmart, you can tell, or an Aldi, you know, like, hey, this is gonna be cheaper than when I go to Target. And part of that is just how they do the setup because they know in people's minds, when they think, oh, it's gonna be cheap, it's gonna be really affordable, that means it's not gonna be a fancy floor. There's not gonna be a fancy ceiling. People aren't wearing fancy uniforms. No, it's more bare bones because they're saving money everywhere they can. And that's one of the things you have to think about, okay? So 10 was B, all right? Number 11. Which type of segmentation strategy is best for small entrepreneurs? That would be B, concentrated. Because small entrepreneurs, you cannot, you don't have the time, you don't have the energy to go after everyone. You really have to concentrate on that specific one target market that's gonna get the biggest bang for the buck from you. Because then if they're super happy with your product or service, they're gonna tell your friends and they'll be like cheerleaders for you. That's why you go for them first. You need to concentrate on those first. That's why 11 is B. And that's actually a big mistake I see uh, new entrepreneurs and new like engineering students that come out with products they think everyone's going to use this maybe but let's start with who's going to get the biggest bang for the buck first okay number 12 which of the following is the usual sequ sequence of steps in the marketing research pro process that's a you define the objectives why are we going to be doing this research okay what do we want to get out of it two then after you define it you design the research then you collect the data then you analyze the data and then you develop an action plan and implementation for that. It's really important that if you do all the research, you're going to do something with it. Okay, if you don't, then you just waste all that time and money. So that's why 12 is A. 13, when Tiffany and Benedict shop around researching different brands of dishwashers for their new house, they search online and look in various stores in order to compare brands and determine which one should they buy. The new dishwasher represent what kind of product? 
That is D, a shopping product, because they're shopping around to compare things, okay? That's why if you have a shopping product, that's, I mean, if you ever buy a computer online, it always lists all the different things, how much RAM it has, how much, you know, space, is it a solid state drive, is it, you know, they list all those things because no, they know people are comparing things, so that's why you have it out there. Those are shopping products, okay? D, 13 is D. 14, please choose the characteristic that is not related to primary data. I'm telling you, 14 is B. It is usually free or inexpensive. No, primary data is expensive, not just because of the money you spend, but also the time it takes, because you're the one that's making the surveys. You're the ones that's giving the surveys or doing the research or having the panels or, or going out and asking shoppers. It takes time, it takes energy, it takes money. Right, so that's one thing that is not part of primary. It's it, it is it is very time consuming. It is expensive. Okay, so fourteen is B. Fifteen. Please choose the characteristic that is not related to exploratory research. That is C. Conclusive research results are verified in this type of research. No. So expl exploratory research is just trying to figure out what is the main issue. Like, okay, our sales are down. Why could that be? Let's think of somebody else. Let's try to get a rough idea of what the real reason is why. That exploratory is exploring the ideas, okay? Like more of a general concept kind of research, where it's conclusive where we're going to figure out that yes or no. Okay, will they buy our sandwich if we sell it at $7? Yes or no? Well, you price it at $7.05. Did they buy it? No, then no, they don't. We are conclusive, the research shows they don't buy it $7.05. So you have that, okay? So 15 was C. 16, the type of data that is collected before we have started research is called secondary data. That is anything that's collected beforehand. So when you write a paper, I'm gonna guess you're looking online for papers to cite, right? So that's secondary research. It's already been collected, okay? 17, Mark, a middle-aged, overweight, yet devilishly handsome mm -hmm. a business person buys an expensive sports car in order to feel young and sexy mark is buying the sports car based on what need that is c psychological need and you'll see there's lots of different reasons why people buy things but yeah psychological needs i mean have you ever bought something because you just you thought it'd make you feel good or you had an outfit that made you look good you're like i like that i have to buy that it's a psychological need okay number 18 Trisha is thinking about buying a new pair of galoshes, wellies, rain boots, and she's not sure if the boots that she's about to buy will do a good job of keeping her feet dry. <laughs> what, ri what risk will most likely shape her search for a new pair of rain boots? D, performance risk, because if they don't perform, they're not going to keep her feet dry. Number 19. Caleb is debating on whether to take his dad to school with him on Bring Your Dad to School Day. Caleb is worried that his father will look silly and the other students will think Caleb is strange because his dad is so silly. Caleb is dealing with what kind of risk? This is B, social risk. So social risk is that risk you have when you're worried what other people are going to think about you. Not the actual risk for you, but just kind of the risk that what are they going to think about me? That's social risk. So, number 20, when friends ask what bars to go to, Maddie, who actually just got married, by the way, always recommends her favorite bars, Cam's Red Lion and Firehouse. Uh, can you tell this is an old question? Cam's Red Lion and Firehouse represent which set of alternatives? That is the Evoke set. Now, here's the thing. Technically speaking, those are all three because it's part of the Universal set. Those are bars that are on offer at on campus. They're part of the Retrieval set because they're places she remembers. But since they're the bars she's going to go to, they're her favorite bars, that's going to be the Evoke set. Okay, so remember that. When you're looking at the options that people have, it all, everything's universal. That's all the options out there. Retrieval, what people remember, Evoke ones they're going to do. So when you see a question like this, Make sure you, you pay attention to the description of it. If, is it one they just thought of or is it one they're going to go to? If it's just one they thought of, that's retrieval. It's one they think, I'm going to go to, that's a vote. Okay? So you have that. 21, which product would cause the most post-purchase cognitive dissonance? That's the fancy way of saying buyer's remorse. You know, it's kind of like a hangover. I had too many. Oh, I feel bad the next day. That's another form of buyer's remorse. So the worst one on here, you have to re realize... Buyer's remorse tends to be higher with the more importance we put on the, the purchase, but also the financial spend on that, okay? So 21, the answer would be D, moving to a new town and buying a house in a bad neighborhood. You're just like, oh, the schools aren't good, and now my kids, I got to pay for it. Oh, what did I do? That's going to cause more cognitive dissonance than, you know, choosing the wrong candy bar from a vending machine. You're out two bucks. You, you'll get over it, right? So there is that. 
Uh, 22. Ken wants to buy a new Xbox gaming system. However, he already has a Nintendo Wii with lots of his favorite games. Therefore, he will have to buy all his favorite games again so that he can play them on my Xbox. This is an issue of which part of the four C's of marketing? That is C, cost to satisfy versus price, okay? Because price, yeah, the new Xbox is $399, but the actual cost to satisfy to make him the same as he was, yeah, it's the Xbox plus the second controller, plus you gotta buy all the games he had before. Yeah, it's not $399, it's more like $899, right? So you have to think about that. So 22 is C. 23, students tend to buy their textbooks from the lowest price vendor. Thus, they mostly buy their textbooks online via Amazon or other online retailers. This is an issue is what part of the four C's of marketing? That is C, convenience to buy. So when you're looking at convenience to buy, you're looking at how people buy. Okay, so if people know that students like to buy online, okay, we gotta make sure we have a good website, we gotta make sure we're using SEO, we gotta be on social media, because that's how they determine what to buy, right? And so we know that. That's why when you're on Instagram, you ever notice there's always tons of like, uh, like printed t-shirts with funny stuff on there? Because they know that people buy their funky t-shirts online. They don't go to a store and go, hmm, let me try on different t-shirts. No, they see it on Instagram, go, I'll buy that now. That's how people buy. So you're looking at convenience to buy. Okay, C. 23, students tend to buy their, oh, sorry, that was 23. 23 is C, sorry. 22 is also C, but. 24, this type of marketing is noted by impersonal electronic communication between the firm and its clients. That is B, business to consumer marketing. As much as I love my Coca-Cola, they're not really talking to me personally. I mean, I know I did find a Mark bottle once, so I guess there's that, but let's be honest, that was a popular name for kids born in my age, okay? so. Probably your dad's name. I don't know. It could be. If, you, if your dad's name's Mark, please put it in the comments section below. Be like, hey, what up, dad? So, you know, F in the comments for that. <laughs> anyway, but 24 is, is B. Business consumer marketing. 25. Mitch is the purchasing agent for Urban Outfitters. He has noticed that his current claw suppliers have been doing an okay job. So if it's an okay job, eh, I'm happy, but there's room to get in. But he may want to look at other possible suppliers. Most likely, it should say Mitch. Mitch would find himself in what buying situation? That would be a modified rebuy. And most of the time in a modified rebuy, people just go back to the play, their usual supplier. But this is the chance that, hey, you know what? I am going to look around. I'm going to see if there's any other cloth supplier that might do a better job, right? So that's why 25 is seen. 26. U.S. customers have demanded faster food for decades. This has helped McDonald's restaurants and other U.S. based fast food chains to become world leaders in the fast food industry. This is an example of what part of Porter's National Diamond Framework? That is D, demand conditions in the domestic market. Because U.S. consumers have made McDonald's and Subway so efficient that when they go to markets that didn't have that level of domestic demand, it was easy for them to take over. That's why if you go to if you go to China, KFC is the big boy over there, right? You got them there. You go to, to you know South America, you see McDonald's all over the place. You go to Europe, you see Starbucks all over the place. You're like, dude, Italian coffee and, and Portuguese coffee is way better. How are there still Starbucks all over the place? Hey, because they know how to do the efficiency side. They know it's location, it's this, it's that. It's not always about the flavor. So something that's very interesting. The, the demand conditions really drove them for that. Okay, so 26 is D. 27, the professional sports league in the U.S. are among the best sports leagues in the world. The NBA for basketball, the NHL for hockey, MLB for baseball. Some say their strength comes from the fact that many athletes play sports at universities that train them and prepare them for professional sports. And the largest sports marketing and sports apparel companies are located in the U.S. as well. This example would fit into what part of Porter's National Diamond Framework in terms of explaining why U.S. professional sports leagues are so good. That's a long question, I know. But the answer is B, related and supported industries. Because they have all these other industries that are there to help them, by the time players get to the NFL or get to the NBA or get to MLB, they've been trained so well that they come in being great, right? And so that helps the NFL do better. That's why the NFL wants NCAA football to keep being healthy because it gives them better employees. Baseball, hey, they want the the you know the AAU circuits, and they want the you know the high school ba baseball teams to be good because that is their kind of farm system that helps them out. So that can make your industry stronger if you have you know those supporting industries. That's why 27 is B. 28. Portugal is a world leader in wine production. One of the reasons is that they have a warm, sunny climate with fertile ground to grow wine grapes. This fits into which part of Porter's National Diamond Framework to explain why Portugal is so good at producing wine. 
That is A, factor conditions. That's the stuff that you need to make things happen. So you need the sun, you need the good land to grow those grapes. That's why it makes it better for Portuguese to make really good wine and affordable too. So just FYI. Number 29, how can firms assess global markets? Well, they can do an economic analysis. Of course, you wanna see if they can afford it or how the money system works there, yeah. Analyze the firm, country's infrastructure and technology. Yeah, we wanna make sure if we're gonna do online banking, do they have the 5G technology or 6G technology for their phones to do that? Analyze the social cultural aspects of the country. Yeah, all those other things. So 29 is D. You would do all of those things to assess global markets. So 29 is D. 30. Which of the following actions is good for domestic consumers? Well, tariffs on imported goods, that's not good because that's a tax on imports, so that makes the price higher for you. Uh, exchange controls limited imports, no, that, that hurts you as well. Boycotts of products from other countries, well, you can't get that, so that kind of hurts you. So none, it's D, 30 is D, none of the above are good for domestic consumers. 31, which of the following puts a tax on imported goods? That's a tariff, that is exactly what a tariff is, it's just a tax on imported goods. 32, the U.S. is seen as an instant gratification society. This means that people focus more on short-term goals rather than long-term goals. Which sociocultural factor would this example relate to? That is time orientation. Remember, there's short-term time orientation. They want it now, right? Or there's long-term. They're looking more long-term on things. And you can actually see that. Like in the U.S., it's more short-term, and so therefore you see like, the stock price will dictate if the CEO gets to keep his job or her job, right? Whereas like in Germany, it's more long-term. The people they hire to be a CEO a lot of times come from engineering and long-time employees because they're thinking long-term because they've been there for a longer period of time. So kind of interesting thing to see. 33, the country with which we are doing business does not like risk. Therefore, they write very long contracts and have wording for every possible situation. Which the following best describes the country? That would be C, high uncertainty avoidance. They do not like risk. Risk is uncertainty, so high uncertainty avoidance it means they really want to keep away from the risk. Okay? 34, in order to go global, McDonald's restaurants sell their, their marketing knowledge and product and service knowledge to local investors in other countries where McDonald's receives a percentage of the total sales. This is an example of what kind of global market entry strategy? That is B, licensing franchising. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. 35. In the U.S., Levi's jeans are an affordable yet fashionable pair of jeans for all incomes. In Germany, Levi's jeans are priced at $200 a pair and seen as a status symbol that young people love. <laughs> used to be. Uh, Levi's has done what in, a, in its different markets? That is C. It developed different product positioning for each market. And you'll see that some brands that you associate with one kind of product might be different in other places. Like some places, it's known as, like Honda is a car company. Other places, it's known as a lawnmower company. Other places, it's better known as a motorcycle company. So it is kind of interesting that companies will have different positions based on different markets. Okay. Uh, number 36, all things being equal, which market would a new product be more successful in? That is A, a country with high GDP. Because higher GDP usually means people have more money. If you have more money, you have more extra money to spend on new kind of products, new things. Where if you don't have money, you're not experimenting very much, okay? Number 37, Kroger supermarkets sell fresh hot bowl peanuts in their Savannah, Georgia stores while selling fresh caught Midwestern catfish in their Champaign, Illinois store. This is an example of what kind of segmentation? D, geographic segmentation. By the way, you want the boiled peanuts, not that catfish. 38, I am a total yuppie. I only drive BMWs and drink Avion bottled water because that is what yuppies do. If you were a firm and yuppie lifestyle was one of your customer segments, which segmentation method would you most likely be using? That's psychographic segmentation. You're looking at how people think, how they identify themselves, right? So you have that. 38 is C. 39, Agnieszka comes to marketing class at 9.30 a.m. to learn about marketing. Kevin comes to marketing class at 9.30 a.m. to hear the funny jokes. And Jocelyn comes to marketing class at 9.30 a.m. to enjoy looking at her very extremely amazingly attractive professor. That's right. What segmentation method should the professor use in segmenting this class? That would be benefit segmentation B, okay? 40, Mark wants to take students to Buenos Aires, Argentina next Thanksgiving. He found 582 students who'd like to go to Argentina. Cool. 300 of the students would even like to go with him. Surprising. But no student wanted to pay $3,000 to go to Argentina with Mark for class credit. Mm -hmm. When looking at segment 
attractiveness, where does Mark have a problem with his student segment? That is B, responsive. Because we could identify them, we could find them, we could reach them. There's a, but the problem was, is we didn't get them to respond like we wanted to. Okay? Then the wig, that's to get them to actually pay the 3000 and want to go and sign up. So that, that's where our biggest problem is. Um, 41, I want an Armani watch. I don't care that it's expensive. I just want an Armani watch. This is an example of what kind of product. That's a specialty product because you're specifically, especially looking for that specific one. That's why they can charge more for it because you want this one, not that one. Okay. 42, if Kellogg's develops an orange and blueberry flavored cereal to sell in the Champagne Urbana market in order to attract Illini fans to eat their cereals, they will be doing what? They will be expanding their product line depth. Because remember, Kellogg's already has lots of cereals. So they're not coming up with a new, completely new product line. They're just coming up with a new product within their cereal line. Okay, so that's expanding product line depth. Okay, they're going deeper into the cereals. 43, if Coca-Cola develops a Coca-Cola themed ice cream brand, they do not currently make ice cream, they would be doing what? That is A, expanding their product line breadth, okay? So since it's a brand new type of product, they're not making another soda, they're not making ice cream, so that's a whole other thing. So that's the product line breadth gets wider, okay? So 43 is A. 44, if a firm uses an existing brand name to promote a brand new product, this term, let's try that one again. 44, if a firm uses an existing brand name to promote a brand new product, this would be termed what? That is B, a brand extension. You, know, you have Coca-Cola, then you have Diet Coke, right? Coca-Cola vanilla, cherry Coke, it's all coming from the Coca-Cola main marketing brand, okay? So that's a brand extension, B. 45, when a restaurant chooses the food it will sell, the color scheme of their restaurants, the training methods for their personnel, they're trying to manage what? That is B, their brand identity. Okay? Because remember, identity is stuff that you can choose. Image is how other people see you, but identity is something you can do and you can control. All right? Number 46. The tube of toothpaste used this morning is an example of what kind of packaging? A. The answer is A. A primary packaging. 47. Which of the following are not one of the five basic positioning principles for brands? Number 47 would be D, catchy. It's cool if it's catchy, but it's not one of the required principles, okay? Enduring and believable, those definitely are, but not catchy, okay? So 47 is D. 48. What is considered the mission statement of a brand? That is D, the brand vision, okay? So you'll see that out there. It's actually quite helpful to know what products or services should go under a different like which name within the company okay 49 professor walters wants to take a group of students to ireland for spring break the trip will be 100 percent accessible so students in wheelchairs will be able to go on the trip professor walters does not know how to get in contact with students who may like to go on this trip when looking at segment attractiveness where does professor walters have a problem with his student segment that the best answer, the best answer is D, reachable. I don't know how to reach them. I don't know how to get in contact with them. Okay, so 49 would be D. Number 50. Did you try to cheat on this exam? B, no. You should never try to cheat on the exam. You'll make my puppy very sad. So I hope this helps you get ready for exam two. We have another video somewhere up here that goes over another one of the practice exams to help you out. I wish you good luck on the exam. You know, you'll do fine. Don't cheat. Don't look off your, your, the person next to you. They're stupid. Don't, don't just know that you're smarter than them. You don't need them and don't help them. Or if you do help them, give them the wrong answers. Okay. That'll teach them. Anyway, I wish you all the best and good luck. Bye.